Hello everyone, you are welcome back to Lady OSTV. If not the first time when they see this shiny, make you know what capas, make you sit down, make you watch, make you share, make you like, make you press the bell. If I upload any, if I upload video, you'll be the first person to see the video. All my returning subscribers, you are welcome. I got the video when I want drop. Make you watch the video, make you put a comment, put an opinion there. Whatever you think about this video, put it in the comment section. I see you guys. Mr. Stata from the UK, you are welcome to the to the show Think Tank. Good evening, thank you. You're welcome, sir. Welcome to you, Mazi Obila. Did I pronounce your name correct? Absolutely correct. Yes, my name is Mazi Obila. Thank you very much Obilo. for welcoming me. Yeah, thank You're you very welcome. much. Highly welcome. Thank you. You are here, um, you jumped in for um, Mr. Shaul. My elites, Shaul was supposed to be here, but because uh, of illness, uh, urgent need for his illness, he, he couldn't uh, jo uh, join us today. So um, we wish him um, everything good. And then we also welcome the Honorable Barrister the attorney of Mazin Nambekanu, Barrister Ifani Ejofo. So you're highly welcome. Thank you so much. Good evening. It's a pleasure being with you. All right, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are starting. I am going to start with you, sir. Barista, let me uh, let me first congratulate you for getting a verdict for the abuse inflicted on you by the Nigerian government. Two years ago, sir, your ancestral home was stormed by a team of security agents. But on December 2nd, 2021, the Federal High Court in Oka delivered a judgment in your favor. So congratulations, sir, once again. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be mine. I appreciate it so much. Famously. All right, sir. So the issue of extraordinary rendition seems to be the, the point of contention in the trial of Mazin Nambekano. And then um, from the information that we have gathered, um, you find a case on the issue of jurisdiction. And at the last hearing, it seems that the issue of jurisdiction has not uh, been resolved. Um, what's your take, sir? Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Um, Robinson. I believe I'm correct. And we, he, uh, yeah, we, he, we filed an amended charge. Uh, they filed an amended charge against our client, Mazin Namikan. Yeah. Seven count amended charge was filed and served on us. Shortly after he was, a um, few months after he was abducted in Kenya and extraordinary rendition to Nigeria. So the part of the cardinal point in which we are raising the objection to the conclusion of the court to proceed with the trial is we are challenging the manner in which, first of all, he was abducted in Kenya and the extraordinary addition to Nigeria, which process is in clear violation of Article 9 and 14 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So, first of all, what is to be established in the first place? Was there extraordinary rendition? Was there an abduction in the first place? Yes. Was there an extraordinary rendition in the second place? Yes. Is there any violation of laws in that respect? Yes. So I um, have been able to itemize the laws, as I mentioned, and also the OAU Convention on the Prevention and Combating of Terrorism which is the law guiding the procedure, protocol for extra, for extradition process, procedures. So these are arguments we have um, advanced and comprehensively canvassed in our written submission before the court. So this is from the first issue we listed for scholarship determination in challenging the duration of the court to proceed with the trial. So, and also, we also delve into the, uh, the charge, the empty, am I with you? 
Yes, I'm are you yeah, okay. we can hear. So go on. We also discuss uh, exhaustively the watering and the emptiness of the seven countermeasures charge filed against our client. So um, these are secondary part of the objections we raised before uh, on the duration of the court to hear the proceed with trial. Uh, so I, I may also uh, put a caveat in the course of this um, uh, this course that uh, we have um, submitted our objection before the court. Okay. A, a court of competent decision, challenging in substance the powers and duration of the court to proceed with here. And under our laws and ethics, we are pretty clear. I mean, the lawyers and the matter on delving substantially into the argument before the court. Uh, because they, if you go well much in, into the argument before the court or what you, argument you can pass before the court, uh, you may be cited for content. So, but that now, that's having, having that understanding, we may have to lead an introductory part of what was discussed in the argument, uh, which hasn't been had. And I believe um, the argument is only competent, uh, but I believe one had, we are of the firm conviction that the court will held it. So, um, is very unfortunate. Let me say this. That should be the first time I mention, I'm saying this to the world. You may surprise you to note that throughout the process filed by the federal government, I mean the seven card amended charge, they filed before the court after our client was abducted in Kenya and a sonar addition to Nigeria and brought before the court on 29th of June 2021. And also in their response to our objection, we filed challenging the duration of the court to hear this, proceed the chart. Here. They never mentioned in any of the paragraphs of their counter affidavit or even address and support that our client, the venue for if our client was arrested in Kenya, they carefully avoided it because they understand the implication of that. Mm -hmm. So they carefully avoided mentioning where he was abducted, even where we raised issue concerning that in our, in our objection. They didn't even address it. They didn't address issues, that cardinal issue of a sonar realization we mentioned in raised argument. Till today, they've not mentioned the open court. Even when we're raising our when we're raising it our submission before the court, they avoided going into it. So that's why we are following them in many forms. Of course, we are we an action has been maintained against them in Kenya. An action has been filed against the Kenya government, and especially the Nigerian government, and also all the parties involved in this or in those act. So uh, we are not leaving any stone on tongue to ensure that the, 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 the infraction is, is, is addressed. Thank you. So, um, yeah. May I still ask you another question because it is still related to the uh, answer you've given to us right now. Go on. Um, <clears throat> in as much as the Nigerian government con uh, continues to to uh, try Mazen Nambi Kanu in Nigerian courts. It all means, like you said, uh, they are breaching the law of uh, the country and the law of every other country where they brought Nambi Kanu to because um, they are acting on a, an illegal background. But then, um, do you, how do you wish to approach this issue? Are you going to go, uh, what is your next move? If they continue to try Mazen Nambi Kanu, are you going to go to any other place, uh, a higher court where you can get jurisdiction? Let, let, let me correct this an impression, this impression, because um, a few days ago I was uh, asked about similar question by an interviewer. So yeah. let me correct this impression. Let me correct this right, impression. Right. Uh, no trial has commenced Nambi Kanu's case. Okay. And they are being careful right. about it. Trial has not commenced, and I can assure you he can't be tried. Uh, because you can, uh, assure, you can assure you can be tried. Yes. Okay. We want, uh, so That's we good. have put we have filed the civil processes in court to challenge the powers of the court to try him. So we are still at the preliminary stage, and the court is under compelling obligation to hear all those pending applications, particularly the one that has to do with the vision of the court, because the court must hear it. Then determine the best pronouncement on it, one word or other. And if the court delivers judgment, one word or other, and it will feel that the judgment delivered is not in our favor, we can ventilate, challenge the decision of the court at the court of appeal. We have other options to adopt. But what we are saying is that we have solid ground for objecting to the trial. 
So trial has not commenced in the first place. Um, once, and of course, again, the man has been for hearing of this objection on 18th of January. And once objection is ruling our favor, that will be that will automatically be the end to that trial to hit 2020 proceedings. And it has to go. So trial has not commenced because it's only when the court hear this objection and rule that the court will assume duration. At this point in time, we are saying, my, my, my Lord, you have no duration to hear this case, to proceed with the hearing. So until when it is hard, the objection is hard and that means, then the court will now say, okay, by virtue of X, Y, Z reason, that I have duration, or by virtue of X, Y, Z reason, I have no duration, I wash my hand off, please. And discharge accordingly, and uh, 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 struck out the charge. So the trial, let me just say, trial has not come, has not commenced. We are still at the priority stage. Of course, you know the system. You know that under 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 conventional trial, under 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 an organized society, or if if is facing a conventional trial, okay, I mean proceedings. By now, you must have gone far on the on the proceedings. But of course, you know the nature of the case we are into. In the kind of system is a political prisoner. It's a matter the state has a trust on. It's a matter I believe to some extent there's an influence on the state. So, and we are managing it. We are being circumspect of all those interests, compared to all, all those interests and influence in the matter. So uh, it's not it's not a, 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 a conventional case. You go to court, find an application, the court to hear and dispose of it immediately without wasting time. Under normal circumstances, we shouldn't be doing this, we shouldn't be romancing at this point, at this stage. This is a person that was brought to brought to uh, extraordinary decision to Nigeria. On the on the 26th of June, brought to court on 29th, and we will file promptly our objection to the charge. Under normal circumstances, they are supposed to have had this objection and dispose of it. And it is more so when the Nepalese law, laws, ACJA and the Ministry of Justice Act, and also the Federal Government, Federal, Federal High Court Practice Direction, we are all stamped on the suspicious nature of, 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 of the proceedings <laughs> of this nation. So it's provided for the hearing, day-to-day -day hearing of this case. But it's not being done. It's not being done. So priority is being given to this kind of case, a case that borders on uh, some allegations brought by SSS. So, but it's not being observed. That's the point. So, uh, so I wanted to understand the circumstance we found ourselves. And within that circumstance, we are doing all we can to ensure that justice is done by applying. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, you, you just mentioned the issue of influence, and that, that prompts me now to, I would like to ask you, uh, Mr. Stutter. Um, can, you, can you hear me, Mr. Stutter? I can hear you clearly. All right. So, um, Kano left uh, for Kenya on, uh, on a British passport, with a British passport, and then he didn't go to Kenya. That's the information we gathered with a Nigerian passport. And even though he did not go to Kenya with a uh, Nigerian passport, he was um, kidnapped and uh, taken to Nigeria. As a British citizen, uh, perhaps you can help us to find out or to figure out uh, why Britain is so silent on the issue of the extraordinary rendition of their citizen, Nande Kano. Um, I, first of all, I'd, I'd just like to say, um, Thank you for welcoming on this platform. Um, I think basically because the UK government doesn't want anybody to know. Once, once the British government accepts that a British citizen has been kidnapped, tortured, an extraordinary rendition, then they have to do something about it. And I think people need to look at the implications for Britain. Should Biafra be free? That, that's the crux of the matter. If, if, if you have a British citizen who anywhere in the world is detained illegally um, or even legally, if someone commits an offence in another country and they're, uh, they're in court, they, they're incarcerated, we would see it on our news. And I can tell you now from the second that Mazdam de Kanu returned to Nigeria, there has been nothing that the, the main media hasn't even given it 30 seconds of media time. So 
you have to question why that is. I mean, we have the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, uh, that's paid for by taxpayers' money. Um, that should be an impartial, an impartial media outlet. I was going to ask you that question, though, uh, but because you have started, um, you can go ahead and explain to us uh, what is the public opinion concerning the uh, ongoing killing of Biafrans uh, uh, among the British citizens. What is the opinion? What do they, what do they do? What do they think? Well, quite frankly, the opinion of the of the British people, especially the white British, is nothing whatsoever because they're totally unaware of anything that's going on. We had possibly when the NSARS massacre took place, I think the BBC gave it 30, 30 seconds, maybe. They actually broadcast 30 seconds of, uh, of footage from the Lekki Tollgate. And yet in the same week, there was a protest in Myanmar where one protester was shot. And that was on our mainstream news on all the channels for at least two weeks. And again, you have to question why. Nigeria is a Commonwealth country, Myanmar isn't. If anything like that happened in any other Commonwealth country, it would be on our news every day for months. And yet there isn't one second of news. So the media in this country, the mainstream media has been compromised. There's no two ways about it. And yet, as I say, the BBC should be impartial. It's not impartial. BBC have got reporters all over the world. They've got reporters all over Nigeria. And yet nothing whatsoever is reported. So in, in answer to your question, what do the British public feel about what's happening? They have no idea. They have no clue. I, I talk to people regularly um, about Biafra and what's happening, May, mainly the, the, the elderly people and even the, the colleagues who I work with, they haven't got a clue. They have no idea. They have no idea. And they're absolutely gobsmacked, to be perfectly honest with you, when I mention about Mazin Amdikanu being a British citizen. They, they're, they're, they cannot believe that they don't know about a British citizen being kidnapped and extraordinary rendition. So unless the media broadcasts what's going on unfortunately the british public will have no they will have no clue no clue whatsoever and that's that's basically that is why the british government do not want broadcast of the issues of mazin and and widely the issues of biafra as well if you if you remember during the biafra war 67 to 70 the majority of the people who were protesting in London were white British. They, they weren't to, black. I was going to ask you that question oh. because uh, an expert told me that uh, for the issue of Biafra to escalate, to get escalated internationally, that uh, the Biafran must get the, uh, the citizens involved in their protest, in their agitation. Yeah. So that's essentially the reason why I was asking you this question and that reminds us um i will ask um your your colleague maze kanutakano maze kanutakano can you hear me very well yes i can hear you yes we are um now i'm going to talk about this from a, a historical point of view uh, I, I would like you to relate this issue to that of 1967 program and the uh, the genocide perpetrated uh, on the Biafran that nobody heard, that nobody ever discussed. Do you see similarities in the media coverage of the Biafran, uh, gen of the genocide perpetrated on the Biafran, which Britain was essentially part of it? Uh, and what is going on currently, given the fact that the incident and the killing of Biafran, the abduction, is not reported, just like we had Mr. Stutter explain. Do you see similarities in both circumstances, sir? Um, thank you very much for having me in this program in the first place. Um, okay. My name is Kanon Takano, and um, welcome all our viewers and listeners. First and foremost, from what Mr. Stutter said, 
It's not different. Let me start with BBC. BBC is an agent of Nigerian government. This is the machinery they are using to operate. When atrocities are being committed anywhere in Biafra land, they find it difficult to report. I said this many times. I declined BBC interview when my brother was renditioned to Nigeria. BBC London, I declined them interview because of their activities, because of the way they reason, because of the way they report the issues that are affecting their friends. I said, no, I won't do that. As a result of protest. Whenever it has to do with anything that will suppress their friends, that is, you, that is the time you see BBC, they will take the leading role. I can tell you, days back, weeks back, months back, when the Polanese were killing us, Gigi had this statement. The only thing that a British newspaper or British reporters would do was to come out and say that there is a clash between the headers and the farmers. And in the right context, who are the headers? How old are they? And how old are the farmers? We are talking about young men that are up to 30 years and above, attacking men and women that are more than 70 years old and above. And the only way to use, the only adjective that will be used is that clash. And my, our consultant, let Jonathan Cooper petition BBC on that note. They did not do anything. So this is what they do. When they kill us, they come out. There was an incident that happened. Let me remind the people, that was in BBC Channel 4 radio in London. The people that started with this notion that IPOB has a militant group called ESF. That publication came out on 7th of August. I tweeted and I confronted them. Why am I saying this? They can only talk about CESN. They can only talk about IPOB because their dream has been to proscribe IPOB, which was there in the foreign, foreign, UK foreign office records, that IPOB is a terrorist group until we went and fought, it was removed. This is the kind of job BBC is doing. It's very unfortunate that the people who are in the position, or more especially, do I say, the British High Commission does not, I repeat, does not report the issues of what is happening to Nigeria, what is happening in Nigeria to the British Ministerial Channel to tell them exactly what is going on. They don't do that. They are always there to protect the full of who are killing innocent people. I can say with every dismay, we know that Nigeria has no president. And the president we are seeing, the person we are seeing today running Nigeria is Katrina Lai, the British High Commissioner. She is the one in charge. She is the one doing all this work. She is the one visiting one state to another. She is the one coordinating. That's why she cannot tell the British people, the British government, that a lot is happening in Nigeria. When it comes to evil, they are looking for Biafra because they knew actually what they did. The extraordinary rendition we are talking about. They knew that it took place in Kenya. But you know what is funny? It's two Commonwealth countries that renditioned a That should be more of a concern to the UK government. Okay. To so, the British Parliament. In your assessment, sir, would you say that it is not even Nigeria that kidnapped Namde Kanobot Britain? Would you say that? No, this is not what I'm saying. What it means is that there is no way the right hand will not know what the left hand is doing. It's not possible. That's my own notion. Because okay. if not, the British government would have gone hard on Nigeria because what they did was they committed an international crime. We should not in any way must have taken place because Nandekano is not living in shadows. Nandekano is there where people can see him. If they think that they wanted him, they would have gone through the right process in this tradition, but they didn't do that. So 
going at the back to have kidnapped him and they brought him back to Nigeria and the authorities are keeping calm. I think that is the biggest crime. That, in fact, that shows in the United States, we can interpret it probably that they have what happened. If not, they would have gone hard on Nigeria and said, hey, this is our citizen, return him back from where you picked him and then follow the due process. If at all Nigeria has the case with Martin and the candidates. You, you this remember, is the thing. Yeah. You remember Omar, Omar Dick of 1985, right? His case was uh, essentially, uh, I think that was December Harry was involved in the effort to kidnap Omar Odiko and bring him to Nigeria to face um, accusation or trial of uh, uh, mismanagement of fund. And Britain, um, uh, I mean, they did it with a, a couple of guys from Israel, that's what the news said. And uh, Britain purported that effort and they went heavily hard on Nigeria. In fact, Britain broke relationship with Nigeria for almost three months, if I'm correct. And uh, they, they were quite hard on Nigeria for attempting to take a, a, a British residence, not citizen. I mean, is, uh, Umar Dika doesn't have British, British citizenship like Nandi Kano. Uh, he was residing there for a while. And then when this happened, Britain went hard on, on Nigeria. And uh, it is quite, I mean, it's, uh, it's disturbing to, to, to see that a British citizen was kidnapped in Kenya, not, was kidnapped in Kenya and brought to Nigeria, subjected under this type of uh, torture, uh, giving him one cloth for the whole month he had stayed there. Um, and uh, a lot of all this thing is going on. The, the country that called themselves a civilized nation is not doing anything. The country that other countries look on, uh, look onto, to put standard of what is civilization and not, is keeping quiet. So this is a very troubling situation, and um, I would like to um, go back to our um, our guest, Oni Guevitus. I want to say um, something before. I want to say something before you continue. I want you to all right, something. Go ahead. Go you ahead. mentioned about Omar Dico, the incident that took place. Yes. They were claiming that this happened in the UK, so and they intervened. And at the time, there was a diplomatic crowd between Nigeria and the UK. And the issue of Nnamdi Kano is something that did not happen in the UK. It happened in a third country. He wasn't traveling with UK. He wasn't traveling with Nigerian passport. He traveled with UK, with UK passport. And he was taken from Kenya and renditioned to Nigeria and everybody's keeping camp. That is what is very, very disturbing. Because we can't sweep this under the carpet. We cannot. We can't. And if BBC could not report this issue, like a prestigious newspaper like um, UK Guardian newspaper carried it, the Sunday Times, we gave them an exclusive interview on this very issue. BBC could not report. The only thing BBC will be able to report, the only thing they are interested in is just to come up to report has a militant group. When they are aware that we are being killed day and night by the same jihadists that they are being, they are supporting. My question is, if they are pointing fingers on IPOB, why is it that they, they've not done anything to prescribe these jihadists that are coming from the foothill of Futa Jalan to enter into to cause mayhem? Why is it that they have not been proscribed or labeled as terrorists? That is the question. Is there anything they are benefiting from it? That is the question. Is there anything UK government are benefiting from it? So they and do the needful, and they should stop playing double standard game. It was the same thing they did when their friends were killed and they are sweeping it under the carpet. Why they don't want to involve themselves actively in the issue of extraordinary rendition of Mazen and the can is a very simple message. There are two things there. It's a two-way con, two-faced con, no matter how you touch it, it's Biafra. Mazen and the Kanu is the face of referendum and is the face of Biafra. They cannot run away, they cannot run away from it. If you're talking about what was arrested, you must have to mention Biafra. And that is why he is doing what he's doing today. That is why we him because we think Nigeria has failed everybody. And if you want to remain in Nigeria, it should be our responsibility collectively to go back to our various kindreds, to our various ethnic groups and decide what kind of Nigeria we want. 
not the one that was being imposed by the community. Thank you. So, um, Mazi Uchenna Obila, Obila, um, you are here um, uh, because he jumped in for Mr. Shao. I wanted to ask him a question concerning the relationship between the Igbos and the Israelites from a historical point of view. And then if this has gone so far that the Israel, uh, I mean, what is the effort? Is there any effort going on there for them to support the agitation of the Biafran? Because there seems to be high, there, there seems to be a, a strong relationship, at least in the issue of genocide. Um, one would say that the genocide against the Igbo is the second genocide and the least most discussed genocide, and that of Israel is the um, the first most discussed genocide. Do you know anything about the Israelites' intention or uh, uh, interest in helping the Biafrans to secure their uh, their independence or their self reliance? Thank you very much, my brother, for um, inviting me in. Um, it's true that I am sitting for our brother Shaul, and um, I'm praying for God Almighty to um, to heal him so that um, he will be able to join you guys whenever you guys call him for um, such occasion next time. Yeah, he and promised I want to that, thank that he'll join whenever he's again. Yeah, I want to thank um, all our guests. I want to thank uh, everybody that is here. And uh, before I go any further, I just want to give um, honor to whom honor is you. And he is no other person but our leader, Mazin Namdekanu. He is one that paved the way for us to be discussing, to be doing what we are doing today. Look at me. I, I, I'm just, I, 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 I'm just nobody. But today, I am discussing about Biafra. It is because of the love we have for Biafra and for hunger of freedom that we all have. We are doing it because we want to be free. We are doing it because we are people that these people have um, disenfranchised. They have taken everything away from us. And we say, no, we want our freedom. Going to your question, I'm so sorry for um, going around and around. I just want to That's say to our leader, he is one that, that, that Pave the way for us to be discussing the way we are discussing today. To your question, you asked if um, if I know anything about the Israeli people. Now, I, I want you to be clear. Interest, are you talking if about? Do have interest in helping the Biafra to uh, secure the type of freedom they enjoy today. The Israelites went right. through the same um, stress. Um, they were killed in millions here in Germany, and a lot of places in Germany here, you still have stones and um, uh, designs to show that this person were, uh, was kidnapped and was uh, killed or hanged, a woman or a man. You see things like that here in Germany. So it is not hidden that the Jewish were killed. Now, there is there are supposed to be a relationship, at least in, the, in terms of feeling. Um, if you see that you are, if you are essentially a, a dark-skinned person, you don't see another dark-skinned person go through stress go through difficulty without having that feeling that is natural and it happens to the same way in human relationship that if you go through serious pain serious uh, difficulty sometimes you don't want another person to go through that apart from that there is a myth concerning the israelite and the evil that they are actually of the same gener the same ground that the evils are essentially the lost tribe of the israelite these are things that we discuss that people discuss Every, every now and then in the Biafra land. Now the question is, having known about this relationship and uh, not the kind of establishment of uh, a relationship in Israel, is there any way they are discussing the issue of helping the Biafrans? That does not necessarily mean they are going to come with weapon or whatever, but moral support in, of any kind. Do you know anything as such? Now, what I'm going to say to you is, as you know, Shaul is one of them. And you know our sister, 
Her name is Rachel. She is one of them. And there are so many other people also. You know, Israel is not a, a, an English speaking nation. You know, I want to bring it like you're asking the question. Some people will be listening for me to say something that the government is doing. I'm not going to that route right now. I'm going through because I listen to what our brother is saying and I listen to the question you ask him. And that is where I want to go through right now. You see, Israel is not speaking. Yes, it's true that people are speaking English right now, but in English is not their number one language here. They speak their language. And for you to get information across, you have to get so many people to understand exactly what you're doing and understand the fight that you're fighting. That is where we are right now. This is the role that we are playing to make people know and make them understand exactly what we are suffering as a people. As a matter of fact, I as number, number one person here, if I have so many people that I've talked to about Biafra, I ask them, do you know anything about Biafra? Of course, they do know about Biafra. They will tell you the story about Biafra. I'm talking about here in Israel. When you meet an elderly person, ask him about Biafra. They do know. They know about Biafra. They will tell you the story about Biafra during the 60s. How they saw children dying of hunger and the rest of them. But right now, they don't know what is going on. So it is our duty to let them know. It is our duty to bring all the story to them. Of course, today you can see our news is not being carried by the, by the media. Everything that is happening to us as a people is being blanket, bl uh, uh, bl blanketed by the media. They don't want to show it to the world. They don't want the people to know because they are hiding something. If you will go back because our people say, if something happened or you want to fix something that happened, you have to go to the beginning. You know, I just don't want to speak evil. But I, I am trying as, as hard as, as possible that I will bring it to each and every one of us so that we understand exactly what I'm trying to say. When something happened and you want to fix it, you go back to the beginning. When you, you, go, when you first, go back... That's, that's an evil adage. Say it in evil first. Then you can we can translate. Say it first in evil first. All right. On a wee on a wu ye me or mini waro ye ga ni shimmi eba ye shi were that is exactly I'm gonna leave it. So all right during the days of during the days of um um this man that was sent from Britain to come to Biafra land. He was the one that came to Biafra land. When he went to the north, they said to him, people across that Niger River, they are the lost tribe of Israel. From there, he knows who we are. And he came in, he find out everything about us as a people. And he came to agree with what they said to him, that we are the lost tribe of Israel. And they came in. What they try to do everything they do to destroy us. As you can see, during the war, they try to destroy our life. But our leader, our eternal leader, Odumir Wujipu, try everything he can to save our life. But people and their media, they tell different stories. Now, they destroy everything about us. They say we have no history as a people. They said, we have no history. They destroy all they can. They stole all they can. Whatever they cannot destroy, they stole it away from us. And we are here as a people today. But where I'm trying, where I'm driving at is, we as a people, we as Biafran, we are the same people with Israel. Israel, Israel that is the people of Israel and Biafra. They are the same people. But the difference there is, the language is what is separating us. Apart from that, we are the same people. It okay. doesn't matter how, and right. it doesn't matter what they say. So that is, the, that is the, the IPOB leadership, are uh, they bringing the information to the doors of the Israelites to give them
to, to create this awareness that is so much needed? I will not want to go that route. Okay. I will say to you that so many things is happening. Okay. And the leadership are doing everything they can, trying in every way possible to make sure that our leader is released. This is exactly where I'm going to hold it for now. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you. So um, um, uh, we are going to um, discuss this also on the uh, basis of uh, the IPOB presence in the world. Uh, uh, how how does this how how can this affect um, the the struggle? But uh, I think this is the question I would like to ask the honourable um, barrister Ejofo. Uh, the IPOB presence in the world is reported as over 108 countries. In this regard, Biafra seems to have an advantage that other countries do not have because some of them hold strategic uh, position in the country where they live. For example, in Britain, there are uh, names you can call like Chile, Omukwe, Chika, Omona, etc. In Italy, you also have uh, an evil man that is in the Italian parliament. And the ICC boss it happens to, uh, Ebua Osiji happens to be an evil man. In United States too, you have a lot, whole lot of uh, um, um, uh, some evil or uh, some Biafrans that, that is said to be the mayor of their city. So, um, the question here is, in as much as this, um, the, the, the evils or the, the Biafrans have this um, upper hand uh, everywhere in the country, are they using it effectively in this struggle? I would like to know, uh, Barrister, do you know if some of these uh, Biafrans, especially those in the judiciary section, are contributing in the struggle by, at least by using their offices abroad to support the effort of your clients? Thank you so much, Mr. Robinson. Um, the questions you asked apparently appears a bit um, uh, confusing, but I will attempt it in a manner that will do justice to it. First of all, the overwhelming presence of IPOB across the world is a clear message that IPOB is a peaceful movement. And um, it's a also clear vindication that IPOB is not a violent movement violent organization. I uh, recall, I will take you a, a step further. I recall that sometime in 2017, IPOB here was politically proscribed. I can put it that way, uh, because um, the order through which the prescribed IPOB uh, was obtained through the back door, and we challenged it. We're still in court of appeal today. So I will think it's not the court of appeal. So the day in hearing this um, appeal is apparently occasioned by the federal government um, inability to respond to the processes filed in court appeal within time. Uh, so but we are moving, pressing further to ensure it is hard and possibly disposed of in appeal. Um, there are a lot of intervening factors, intervening um, interventions by people, uh, erudite scholars uh, across the world who are of, um, of uh, evil instructions, I'll put it this manner. Uh, so they're making their contributions, not financially, but um, assisting in Material-wise, it's not um, professionally in the one in which can, I can let me put this way because I wonder I want us to discuss our strategies here, all our strategies here because uh, a, lot, a lot of people are listening. You can see, of course, you can know you observe that I'm not um, being participating in video uh, all right. discussion all right. all right. uh, for reasons uh, I believe you should know. We understand. So, yeah. uh, so I wouldn't want to. Going to the merits, otherwise, you don't have all the to, sir, if it is not correct, you yeah. don't have to, so, right? Yeah, so because but I can work and assure you at this point in time that um, we have our people across the world who are into relevant um, uh, institutions, uh, relevant institutions, judiciary, and all whatnot, who are in one word or the other assisting the legal team tremendously. So, uh, by oh, through well. research, but also through legal opinions. And so and it's assisting it's, a, it's a help helping us in no small measure that I can confirm to you. And so um and also also be take note of the fact that the pressure of um IPUB, uh pressure of IPUB across the world through their protests, their demonstration, peaceful protest, uh, in demand for the release, unconditional release of um Mazin Namdekano is impacting positively in what we're doing here. I won't say further than this. 
but um, but, but um, we are making progress. And I must commend them, commend those who are helping us. My travel in, in, in different, different, in their different sectors, different endeavors. So uh, they, they are doing wonderful, that I can say to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So um, mm. this is Miro African Diaspora TV, Matt. So once again, this is the leading media and in representation of uh, African culture and politics. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube to be notified each time we post a new video. Once again, my name is Robinson Ambrose. I'm from Efuna. Welcome to Miro African Diaspora. Welcome to the program Think Tank. So um, the question once again to you, Mr. Starter. Um, like I've said, so we discussed the issue of what some experts said about the struggle of the IPOB that the British citizen has to be brought um, uh, the, to the awareness of what is going on currently of the inhuman circumstances that the Biafran has been subject to. And uh, we also agreed to the point that for the, uh, the plight of the Biafran to be heard in 1967, it was essentially the British citizen that moved out in the city and started demonstrating that made it, um, that changed the game. Also, we must um, remember to emphasize the fact that Mazin Namdekano has always maintained and said that, uh, that essentially that the normal British citizen is a good person. I don't know if any of you would remember that, but I do remember he said that his, um, his accusation has never been to the citizen like he had never accused the normal Fulani rather than those that are killing and maiming his people in Biafra land. He also, I believe, had never accused the normal citizen. He has also said that the government is doing it wrong against the Biafra. So my question, sir, what do you think that uh, the Biafra should do in order to bring this issue, uh, to make the, the, the government, uh, the British government change their mind, uh, or at least, uh, change their, their, their behavior of indolence, their behavior of, of uh, disinterest. What do you think Biafra should do, in your opinion, sir? Um, <clears throat> they need to contact their MPs. Because the only, the only way of, of, of doing anything to change any sort of government um, policies in this country is, is to make MPs aware whether they're aware now or not of what's going on. And then the MP will bring that um, to parliament and ask questions because questions need to be asked. Because questions need to be asked as to why one, a genocide in a Commonwealth country is being allowed to take place with no broadcast, no mention through the media whatsoever. And secondly, the extraordinary rendition of one of its own citizens, no one knows. Do the MPs know? Don't know. Oh. The, M the MPs and Parliament will know on whatever information Catriona Lang is given to the British people or to the British Parliament. To the Foreign Secretary, a new Foreign Secretary now, which is uh, Liz Truss. Does she know? How much does she know? So the How demonstration... So, so the demonstration alone is not enough. A demonstration is good if you involve everybody in it. The, the, the problem is, if, if you have a demonstration of 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 Biafrans, to the normal person on the street, the normal white British person, what does that represent to them? That's the problem. So all Biafrans in the UK, they need, they need to raise awareness. They need to raise awareness when they're at work. They must work with white people. They must talk to white people. Make them aware. Don't they? Sometimes it can be very, very difficult through whether they're embarrassed by what's happening, whether you know, they don't feel they're in the right place to say something. But make people aware of it. Write to your local paper. Write to your local radio station. 
a lot of radio stations are independent. They don't belong to the BBC. They don't belong to the mainstream. Talk to them. Let them know what's going on. Because you won't get anything from, from the actual government. You won't get anything from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office whatsoever. So you need the MPs to ask questions of the, the government, of the Prime Minister, of the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office. You know, if you're put in a position as the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Minister and you don't talk about what's going on in a Commonwealth country, what, what sort of position is that? You know, how, how can you put a blanket smoke screen over everything and not, and not give information out? It's, just, it's, it's totally wrong. But the, the, as I said before, the truth will come out. And the truth will come out when normal Biafrans, British citizens, get in touch with their MP and ask that question. They have to respond to your questions. Yeah. They have to. That's, that's a parliamentary rule. They yeah. have to. But you have to write to the MP in your constituency. You have to do that. You've got a classic example. You've got Harriet Harman. Yeah. Harriet Harman, who's the MP for Camberwell and Peckham, the constituency that Mazin Amdikanu comes from. She, she hasn't said a word. Okay. How, how can you get a member of parliament who, when one of your own constituents is extraordinary rendition, tortured for eight days, and still illegally held in custody, and you don't say anything? I, I asked this question, sir, because I wanted to create a connection between the question I asked the barrister previously, which I tried to find out if there are Biafrans working um, on the legal basis that they're trying to help uh, on the work they are doing at home, because these guys, uh, barrister and his colleague, they are doing tremendous work. And uh, I believe that, um, like you've just pointed out, the demonstration alone cannot uh, bring the desired required effect. But this issue of going to the PM is very essential. And uh, the moment they are involved in the, uh, uh, in the issue, in the affair, with much more question, with penetrating question, I think it might change the, 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 the dance and the music of the whole of the whole struggle. So having said this, I would like to go to your colleague, Maze Kanu Takanu. Um, that might be perhaps our last question, actually. And uh, my question is this, sir. Um, I would like to draw your attention to the ongoing discussion about Ojo's or Carlos' visit to Namde Kanu in the DSS dungeon. Uh, this visit has been completely discredited by Barrister Ejiofo and yourself. However, one statement that has made wave on the internet uh, seems to be the question uh, Senator uh, Kahlo asked uh, Namde Kahlo. And this, this question is, why did, he, why did he leave his home in Afaruku village after the invasion of the Nigerian army in, 20, in, in 2017? So what do you have to say um, about this question? Um, thank you for that very question. For him to have asked such question means that he knew what happened in 2017. Because um, asking that question means that he was part of the people that planned the assassination of Mazen and the Khan. Not only that, to assassinate the whole family of the Khan. Because um, he ought to have known in the first place what that meant. But it's very unfortunate that such people are being called senators. These are senators in Zulu, in that contraption called Nigeria. It's, I mean, it's shameful because such people are supposed to be in that position. Not too well that he was once the governor of five states. He looked at the state treasury. And by now, he's supposed to be in detention. He's supposed to be in jail, serving life in prison. But they didn't allow him. They just allow him to come out. Come out. He went to prison. He went to DSS. He saw us and Namde Kandi came out. He was talking nonsense. Like somebody that took that took drug. In the first place, I saw what he wrote and what he's talking. But it's very unfortunate that Nigeria, when 
come out and talk about elitism. It's just like children who are in the Western world who are doing just level four and five in the school. This same man went and brought somebody I was going through the media today in Port newspaper. I saw a person, he read a journalist called Ida Mina Bere, Ibelema, writing nonsense, talking about what this of Khan and told Mars and the Khan to remember about what happened during 1966 school. It's very laughable. Why are they talking about these things? Now it comes to Q of 1966, they will remember that Tukuma Kaduna and Zogu is a Biafra. But if it has nothing to do with Biafra, they will remember that they are from Delta and from Niger Delta. That is very, very laughable. They should as well remember that what happened, like they are accusing these same people of war, they should forget that that was something they refused to implement. The program, they started killing evils. As far back as in the 1914, all through till this very time. And the issue was for them to go out and discuss a better way to move Nigeria forward. They forgot to talk about Aburi Accord. They refused to talk about it. But in this case, this fool, I don't know where it's coming from, is coming right in junk about countries of Khan. You cannot protect someone who is a criminal. This man is not supposed to be part of the ruling government. But because in Nigeria, everyone works in Nigeria. So any idiot can come out, you can kill, you can do the treasure, when you come back, and people will vote you in. Tomorrow you'll be addressed as anything. From my own opinion, from what I think, this are disgrace, these people, more especially Audrey Zokan, is a disgrace to those people that believe in one Nigeria. I don't believe in that one Nigeria. I was never born as a Nigerian. I was born as a Biafra. So when they talk about these people, they are very, very disgusting. The first thing they should be talking about is the problem affecting the people of the South East. That is the key thing. But if he refused to talk about it, he went, he was talking about irrelevant things. That tells you that he's just in the brain, that so, he is not normal. So essentially you are saying that Ojo Zokalo asked the wrong question. He should have asked, why did the uh, Nigerian army invade your brother's home. That should have been the question. Is that what you're saying, sir? That, absolutely, that would have been the question. He knew very well. Everybody in Southeast, all of them that participated, check out the ex governors of other states, from Ojo Kano to TOG to President Pastor Okezi Basu, all of them are one and the same thing. This orchestrated by Okezi Basu, he was the one that brought the Nigerian military, made them with the state money. Count them in the Duku bunker, count them everywhere to invade my home. They were all aware of it. These people were all aware of it. He's not asking why they run away. They should not forget that Mazen Namdekano went on inventory exile because his life was threatened. He was due to go to court. Okay. In September, before they invaded our home, what was the reason for them to do that? because they wanted to kill him. This is Nigerian state. And that is why I am very, very upset where those of them who claim to be ambassadors, the high commissioners to Nigeria are, because they are misleading the British people. You, said, you asked Mr. Stata one question before. I can tell you, I've lived in UK. The UK people are very wonderful people. They are conscientious human beings. But we will have problems and where the politicians are. Not a, a common UK citizen now. They are wonderful people. This is what it is. So, but if this woman could go back and give them the message of what was happening, there won't be issues. The former ambassador who was there, the UK High Commission, when my house was raided, was awkward. What did he do? He swept everything under the carpet. Because all of them, southern in Nigeria, all the whole the moment they get into Nigeria, they are being a package of one million dollars. So you don't see, you don't talk. That is why Nigeria remains where it is today. And Nigeria cannot succeed. The only way Nigeria can succeed is only when the people come out and look at themselves in the face and say, hey, things are not moving the way it is. That is the only time we move forward. But as long as 
We are relying on pastors to determine if we have to live or die. Things can never be the same. They can accuse us the way they want. They can say everything they want to say. That is entirely their own business. Because in the last days, you can hear in the newspaper, everything they attach it to IPOB ESL. What are they trying to achieve? We know how they operate. When they start these things, this propaganda, they are making, creating ways for themselves. So that when they strike, they will say, after all, we've been talking about it in the newspaper. This is how they operate. I understand it, and every person who is a good student of Nam the Kano, a good student of Radio Biafra, we all must have to understand this. This is the way they operate. They bring their soldiers in Biafra land who are killing and pointing fingers on the hands. They pointing fingers on ESM who don't even live in the streets. Rather, they live in the forest. These are people they are pointing fingers on. Yesterday, the same of Imo State, but being led by hopeless or demand, they went and kidnapped Chinese foreigners. What are they trying to do to say that it's their friends that did that? We knew. And we've never been able to bring the world to notice that what's happening in Biafra land has nothing to do with Biafra. It has to do with those people, the Fulani people, who are conscious, who think about themselves, who want to colonize our land. And that is one thing we will not allow it to happen. We right. suffer it and we keep suffering. And if they don't change it, we are not going to stop. We take our ground. No interest will be given to the Fulani from Sahel. It will not happen. All right, sir. Um, uh, before we get, uh, we're almost to the end of this uh, program. I still want to say something concerning your person. I think it must be a big um, a struggle for you as uh, a brother of Nam the Canada, the same time as IPOB member. You are, I mean, what your family is going on, uh, going through this moment. I mean, I can't just imagine it. Uh, how do you handle it, sir? I mean, uh, it's it's a heavy stuff to to go through. How how do you get get along with this? As a human being, we are being driven based on what is happening. We lost our parents because of this very thing. I was a witness in 2017. Watch so many people kill. Watch so many people die in my presence. And these are people who are not supposed to die, but we could not help them because there was no way to transport them out. I was in a car with a young man. The Nigerian military took him away. Up to today, nobody saw him. This man was married, had two children. Even at that time, the wife was pregnant for the third, for the third child. Sometimes, when I sit down and look back and think about all these things, I said, no, I can't stop. I cannot stop. What we will say is, is either we get Biafra or we die getting Biafra. That is the only thing that is driving us. And that is the only thing that drives me today. And the hardcore, the hardcore Biafrans know that very well. We will not change. It's only we either we get Biafra or we die getting Biafra. Because what we are living now is not life anymore. We are not living anymore. We are dead people walking. Any person claiming to be living must be deluded. Thank you, sir. What what do you have to tell to do what we have to do? What do you have to tell to your to your viewers concerning the unity that they need in order to get through? That's your last word, sir. We are closing. What do you have to tell Thank to you your, very much? Yeah. You the me. unity of IPOB, IPOB is one family and there is no one family. It doesn't matter what is happening. All we right. are not, right. we are not fighting. All right. It's only people sometimes, you know, in life, some people want to show what they can do. But at the end of the day, they will try and they will still come back to join the queue. So it's a brother issue. That is, we have one structure. Yes, of course, it's a family issue. All right. We have family one issue. Is the family issue? All right. So it's not. It's not something that needs to be discussed anywhere. It's the family issue. All when right. we have problem, it's between us, and we know how to handle it. But for now, there is only one structure. There is only one command, and there is only one IPOB. That is how it is. Thank you very much, my brother. Thank you very much, sir. Um, um, I think I will have you last, barrister, to conclude the whole thing. If you are still there, I hope you are still there. Um, so. Mr. Stata, um, your last word for this uh, for today's conference. Um, you are a British citizen. 
you have said a lot of things concerning how this struggle should be moved to get the Britons, uh, the citizens involved. So what's your last word for those Biafrans in UK? Um, what they should do in order to get the citizens involved? Our topic today has to do more with escalating, not just talking, but also involvement of the international uh, people into the Biafran struggle, how it works and what should be done. So what is your take, sir? Those, I, I, mean, I, I, would I would just emphasize what I said before with um, <clears throat> all Biafrans in the UK um, to petition their MP. Okay. If they don't hear anything from their MP, then go outside their office. Okay. Go outside their office and don't move until they listen to you. Protest, 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 but protest to the MPs, protest to Parliament. Make people aware. Make your white friends aware, your white people in your neighbourhood. Make them aware what's going on because they don't know. They genuinely don't know. And to all IPOB all over the world, the magnificent job that you're doing, never, ever relent. Because Biafra will come. Thank you, sir. Whether they like it or not. Thank you for your strength. Uh, it reminds me of the fight of the, during the slave trade. It was uh, uh, the worst thing, the, the most dramatic thing that ever happened on earth is slave trade. And then it was perpetrated against the black people by the white. But then we also have to remember that slave trade was not abol was abolished not only by the strength of the uh, black people but also by the white. So the type of effort you bring, I do commend you and I thank you very much for the for the strength you invest in fighting for Biafran. Thank you very much, Mr. Stata, a politist, a political activist from the UK. Thank you very much for, for coming on our platform, Miro African Diaspora TV, live on Facebook, and. Um, Mr. Mr. Ma, Mr. Uchenna Obila, your last word, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to each and every one of you. Um, I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough. Um, Almighty Chukuk Gabiamana will worship. In case you don't know, he is the creator of heaven and earth. That is, in our language, we call him Chukuk Gabiamana. I am saying this for you to understand, Mr. Sheta. So, to the whole world, I just want to say, be a friend all around the whole world. Keep on doing what you're doing. It may seem that what we are doing is not paying any, you know, is not yielding any fruits. It may seem that what we are doing is not making any wave. Do not allow what they are doing to deceive you. Remember, the Zoological Republic of Animal Kingdom, they vote out so much money, so much money to distract you. They vote out so much, so much so All right, to sir. make you feel you the way you're feeling today. Okay. I will say, please, keep on doing what you're doing. Almighty is in heaven and he is watching at the end. Thanks for watching, guys. See you guys for my next video. Bye-bye.